Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Roy Smith analyzes the dead cat bounce in the soybean market. Jason Lusk talks about failed ballot initiatives in Colorado and Oregon that would have required GMO food labeling. Kate Brooks discusses whether beef producers should think about expanding their herds. And Charles Shapiro weighs the efficiency of fall nutrient applications. Roy Smith is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. The USDA's latest progress report shows Nebraska's farmers are almost finished with their soybean harvest at 95 percent complete. The state's growers are 60 percent through with corn harvest, five points behind the national average. Monday, the agency will revise details on this year's corn and soybean crop when it releases its November crop report. We started our conversation with Roy Wednesday afternoon by asking for an update on harvest near his area of Cass County, Nebraska. I think soybean harvest is for all practical purposes finished up and I'm going to guess that corn harvest is probably 80 to 90 percent finished. So we've had a couple of good weeks here and uh, took advantage of them and got a lot of grain put in the bins. How was the quality of grain around this area? The quality is excellent. Uh, you compare it with last year where uh, we were really short on uh, moisture part of the summer and the uh, the corn was, uh, the kernels were very shallow, very small. For this year, the corn kernels were big and nice and shiny. I mean, the, the quality just looks excellent. And, and there was a lot of it. Or there is a lot of it, I guess I should say, because there's still a few fields around that haven't been harvested. And the elevator that's close by here has got a big pile on the ground already. Corn and soybean markets this week, uh, Monday and Tuesday, didn't start off real well, but you've been watching the dead cat balance. Update me on how that went. Right, I always look for a harvest low somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2nd of October, and this year, in fact, it was the 26th of September, which was a bit of a surprise for me because I thought with the big crop and the good weather and everything, it might be a little late, and in fact, it was a little early. And the rally from the September low that I was talking about till the early part of this week was like a dollar and 35 cents a bushel. Uh, that's about a dollar more than we expect in a real good year and the timing was excellent on it. it. The top on that happened to come when a lot of people had beans in the elevator ready to sell and and so I, I'd say the, the dead cat bounce this year is one of the best ever and I hope people have taken note of that and taken advantage of it. It's not that the price can't go up some more, but uh, we've seen a correction already of almost 50 cents a bushel. So, uh, the, you know, there was a chance to sell some at some very good prices and well, whether they'll come along again, I don't know. You, uh, I was reading your article on agriculture.com and, and you said the uh, relationship between futures prices and basis moved differently than maybe you would have expected it to? Normally when we see the dead cat bounce, we see the, the basis on soybeans get better as harvest gets wrapped up and, and uh, beans get sold and so forth. This year, the basis 
got worse as, as time went on. Not a whole lot until about the last week. And then uh, this last week with, with uh, soybean futures uh, higher than they had been earlier, we saw the basis get worse. So I, I, I don't know quite what to make of that, but uh, I'd say that fortunately we had a big enough run up in the futures market to more than compensate for that. So tell me where you are with uh, sold beans right now and then your thought process for getting rid of the rest. I'm, I'm about 80% sold uh, just the last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, fortunately, the, the rally came just right for me. I had the beans in the elevator and hadn't started paying storage on them yet. The storage was going to start Saturday and we got the beans sold Thursday and Friday. So I, I feel pretty good about that. Uh, it doesn't always work that way, but uh, when it does, well, I will take it. And, and so uh, I have about 20% of my crop left that I'm going to put in commercial storage and store till spring, simply to test whether or not the rally we have been seeing the last four or five years will repeat this year. I don't have enough of them in there that it's gonna break me if the market goes down, but uh, it certainly will be interesting to watch believe that is thunder. We might get a little wet here yet, Roy. <laughs> November 5th, and we're having a thunderstorm. Yeah, and a few showers as well, apparently. Okay, uh, so give me your general thoughts on corn here before we wrap up. The corn very similar to soybeans, the dead cat bounce in corn followed the, the, uh, the one in beans, and it also, wheat also did follow that. The corn uh, market rallied about 56 cents before it, it fell back. Uh, so my general recommendation for people that are wanting to use a dead cat bounce to sell corn is when you sell beans, sell corn too. And that would have worked this year and probably still will work as the time goes on. Any thoughts on the November crop report next week? It's a little early to, to draw very many uh, startling conclusions from whatever the crop report says uh, because the numbers are probably not all in yet. but. Uh, I, I guess I'm thinking that we're probably not going to have any bearish surprises. We're probably not going to see a crop bigger than what people anticipated because there are some areas in uh, Illinois and Indiana where the crop wasn't nearly as good as what we've had here in Nebraska. The USDA's November crop report is scheduled to be released Monday at 11 a.m. Central Time. Next week, Elaine Cub will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets and their reaction to those estimates. Voters in both Oregon and Colorado Tuesday opted against ballot initiatives that would have required GMO labeling on food. The measure failed by a wide margin in Colorado, but the spread in Oregon was so narrow it was too close to call the following morning. In only the last few years, voters have rejected similar measures in both California and Washington. Earlier this year, Vermont passed labeling laws, as did Connecticut and Maine previously. But all three were done through state legislatures, and Connecticut and Maine laws only enact if other states do the same. In addition to its incredibly tight margin, the ballot measure in Oregon was also extremely costly. The Associated Press says that campaign was the most expensive ballot measure in state history, with about $20 million in opposition and $7.5 million in favor. Jason Lusk studies consumer behavior and foods for Oklahoma State as a Regents professor and Willard Sparks Endowed Chair in the University's Department of Agricultural Economics. We talked with Jason Thursday morning and began by asking if he was surprised at the results in Colorado and Oregon. I think especially in Oregon, uh, it was really too close to call, so I think it would have been hard to be surprised either way. Uh, but in both of those races, as has been the case when there have been other uh, mandatory labeling initiatives in other states, these uh, initiatives have started out uh, polling very uh, favorably. Most it look, look like they're going to pass with uh, wide margins, and now in four cases, ultimately have failed. So in that case, it is a little surprising uh, in terms of the extent to which people's uh, minds can be changed on the issue. That means then that they're willing to listen to the debate or at least the advertisements? Right, well, there, there is a lot of advertising spent and indeed I think uh, in the case of Oregon, I, I believe that this was one of the most expensive ballot initiatives that, that the state has ever had in terms of advertising. So yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of messaging that's going on out there, but ultimately there are people sitting at home listening to those messages and apparently uh, some of them must have, have changed their mind. 
Is there an argument to be made that the pro-labeling crowd merely lacks the cash to make this uh, a little bit of a, a fair fight? I, I think someone could make that argument. Um, the, the folks that are fighting against the mandatory labels have spent more and they, they do have more money at their disposal. So that, that is part of the story. Uh, but I, I think ultimately that if you look at the, the science and uh, the arguments against the labels, that, that really I think it is a more compelling argument. And in surveys that we've done where we show people advertisements, uh, some people see the pro-advertisements, some see the negative advertisements, that the negative uh, the advertisements against the mandatory label are more persuasive with people. So this is uh, not who has more money, but just comparing ads to ads. And it looks like the sort of negative ads are often more persuasive. Right, and to the flip side of that previous question would be, how many of these uh, people that are in opposition would be anti-GMO, and how many would just be anti-big company like Monsanto? Yeah, it's a it's a consortium of people, as it is on any sort of issue. Uh, and I, I think there's a little bit of a dichotomy to, uh, I think one of the main arguments people use in favor of the labeling is that consumers just have a right to know. Uh, it's a little hard to know how far those rights should extend and uh, whether we're willing, you know, what we're willing to pay for those rights uh, and how those rights should be balanced against, uh, you know, farmers' um, rights to not disclose information. But, um, you know, all that being said, I think that in that movement, there are at least some people that are, are rabidly anti-GMO and use quite frankly, all sorts of questionable science to, to make scary claims about the technology, which, which the best scientific literature really doesn't support. That's not true necessarily of everyone that promotes that label, but that is true of a segment. We've now seen initiatives fail in California, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. Does it look increasingly like state legislatures are going to be the route for passing any sort of labeling laws? Well, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I hate to predict the future, but that probably does seem to be the case. Um, you know, we've seen in Vermont is the only state right now that has passed a mandatory labeling law, and it was done so through the state legislature. We've got a couple of uh, other states in the Northeast which have done something similar, although their, their laws were somewhat interesting in that they have contingency clauses. They don't go into effect until a certain number of other states go into effect. And that does point to this issue that the labels could be costly and these states don't want to be sitting out there as the only ones that are incurring this, this uh, higher cost for themselves. So yeah, there, there seems to have been more success in terms of state legislatures uh, than there have been in terms of just public voting ballot initiatives. Do you think cost of labeling is a realistic argument here? I, I think it's hard to know exactly what the economic consequences can be. Uh, so on the one hand, people that advocate on behalf of the, of the label say, well, food companies change their labels all the time. This is really not that costly, just to add a few words to it. And, and in one sense, they're right about that. Uh, on the other side, I, I think uh, other folks would argue that, well, you gotta, you gotta look uh, at the unintended consequences, or maybe the intended consequences, depending on which side of the, uh, which perspective you have. And that is, uh, how will food companies respond to this label? And uh, I think a lot of food companies don't want to put a label that says, may contains genetically engineered food. They're, they're fearful that they'll lose customers if they do that, that some people may interpret it as a sort of skull and crossbones. And if companies, if that's their feeling, and, and uh, let's say one of their competitors adopts a policy, says we're not gonna label anything with GMOs, and, the, and they, uh, they start losing some market share of those companies, they may start to try to source non-GMO products or organic products, and, and that could really drive up the cost. Uh, and that's the sort of concern, I think, that some people have about the label, the kind, that, that it's that kind of cost that could really uh, increase food prices. But I think an, an honest observer would have to say, we, we don't really know what the outcome could be, and it could, could be somewhere in between those two. I was reading uh, one thing you said to close out here, is that you're not necessarily concerned about the cost, but you're concerned that this could lead to less agricultural innovation. Can you explain what you mean? Yeah, I, th I think we get, we get sort of tied up a lot talking about the immediate cost of the label. Will it cost the average you know, US household if, mere pennies each year or thousands of dollars each year. I mean, those are real costs and that's an important debate to have. But, but I think the broader issue is a longer term issue. And that is if we adopt an environment that is hostile to innovation in food and agriculture, those could have significant long term costs and consequences. For example, you know, another ballot initiative that was um, that we had on Tuesday was in Hawaii and Maui, and they actually voted to ban 
the production, or at least put a moratorium on the production of GMOs in Hawaii. You might say, well, you know, who cares about Hawaii? You know, it's, it, it's, that's not a big piece of the puzzle, but, but a lot of the biotech companies have research and development facilities there because they can grow crops year round and do all kinds of research. And, and it's those kinds of policies that really hinder research, that make research more expensive, that limit the, the potential technologies that we can expect to see in the future. And so it, it's the foregone opportunities that we, we may witness that are really may entail the bigger costs. You can find more from Jason on GMO labeling and consumer behavior on his blog. We'll link to that on the Market Journal homepage. In our two previous episodes of Market Journal, we've looked at issues that will be discussed at the 2014 Cornusker Economics Outlook meeting starting November 17th. This week, UNL Extension Livestock economist Kate Brooks joins us to talk about the possibility of expanding the cow herd. That small inventory is helping prop up cattle prices not long after a prolonged drought forced farmers and ranchers to sell animals to help ease losses. The cattle in this state consume about a quarter of Nebraska's soybean meal, meaning fewer cattle could lead to less demand. It should be noted, though, the price of that feed is now much more affordable thanks to record corn and soybean crops. Kate joined us Thursday morning. We began by asking her to describe the current price levels for calves. You know, we've seen a lot of strength in fall calf prices. Typically this time of year, calf prices tend to dwindle a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of calves come to the market mm -hmm. in the fall, and so we see those prices decline. We have short supply this year, and we've actually seen those prices again this year in the fall have strength over pre earlier in the year. That's what's holding it up right now, that tight supply. You, both sides. You know, we've got the tight mm -hmm. supply. We've got the feedlots that are wanting that bunk space used up. We've got stockers. We've got good pasture. Um, and so that's beating the prices. Plus, we've got strong demand. And so, you know, all of those factors are weighing in, helping to keep those prices strong. Okay, so for the farmer or rancher who's, uh, they have these calves, they're really expensive. Do you sell them now or do you precondition and put some more money into them? You know, it's every producer is going to have to weigh their options and sit down and actually budget that out. You know, is it worth those extra few dollars to go ahead and hold them on, hold on to them, or is it better off for them to kind of sell now? You know, sometimes we get some premiums offered if we do a 45 day preconditioning period. You know, sometimes when the prices are up, you don't always see quite those big of premiums. So, you know, that's one thing producers are going to have to weigh in whether the cost of the feed and those extra few days are going to weigh in to help. Um, carry them through. The other issue is whether they sell them in 2014, hold them to 15 because of tax breaks. Okay, uh, this is different than I think a little bit different than last year and way different than two years ago where you know you were looking to just cut and get through the winter but now is it different that you're actually looking at maybe expanding the herd? You know there are some producers out there that are starting to look at expanding. You know if you look at those unit drought monitor maps Nebraska's out of a drought. Yeah. You know, we've got some of the best pasture compared to a couple years when we probably had some of the worst pasture. Uh, and so we might have some forage available. We might have some of those resources that we might look at trying to expand the herd. There's other options. You could buy some stalkers, hold your calves a little bit longer, or look at, you know, either buying some heifers or retaining some of your own heifers. What about for the person who says, you know what, cows are really expensive right now, but I might want to buy a few and uh, put them on my farm. What do you say to that person? You know, we've got to look at our options. Uh, right now, you know, you can get up to $3,000 thousand dollars for a heifer you know for some of these bred cows mm. trying to put them into your herd it's gonna have a lot of capital outlay and so we've got to kind of look at where the prices are gonna go you know depending on where we're at in the price cycle and what happens with prices mm. that heifer may or not may or may not be profitable in the long run mm. um, so I think each producer needs to kind of weigh that out look at what their unit costs of production are what their costs per cow are uh, if you're a lower cost producer you might be able to afford a little bit more for those heifers if you're a high cost producer you probably can't afford to pay for some of these. Let's talk about the feedlot for just a second. Tell me where those margins are right now. You know, we've continued to see improvements, mm -hmm. profitability in the feedlot sector compared to several years ago. You know, last year we started to see some of that improvement, but we continue to have open bunk space, you know, and so those feedlots continue to squeeze that margin. Even though corn prices might come down a little bit, we've seen fed cal feeder calf prices continue to rise, and so, you know, we s tend to squeeze those margins. The Cornusker Economics Outlook meetings will be held at five locations in Nebraska starting November 17th. For more information, you can contact local UNL Extension offices or visit agecon.unl.edu slash CEO. Next week, Tina Barrett from Nebraska Farm Business, Inc. will join us to look at profit levels for crop and livestock producers and talk about determining costs of production. 
As we mentioned at the beginning of this episode, favorable weather is helping farmers wrap up the 2014 harvest. That means growers will soon be turning their attention to the off-season and getting ready for the 2015 season. Earlier this week, UNL Extension soil scientist Charles Shapiro joined us to discuss fall nutrient applications. But after a very wet season in many parts of Nebraska, we started by asking Charles how we know what's actually in the soil profile. We take a soil test, right? That'd be the first thing to do. I, I would also recommend that we, if we have a yield map or something uh, that gives us an indication of where we had really good yields and really poor yields that we check uh, those spots because they're, because of the variability this year, there's gonna be a difference in the amount of nutrients removed. And as you mentioned, a lot of rain, that means that probably the nitrogen is gonna be maybe even lower than normal. Of good yields and a lot of water means that there's not gonna be a lot of nitrogen left over. How much variation can there be in those high yielding areas uh, in terms of what nutrients are actually there? The high yielding areas uh, are going to remove based on how much removal for bushel and if uh, the producer is using the residue for something, uh, baling it or cattle are out there, uh, there would be even less there. But basically they're interested in the phosphorus and potassium. Uh, on our sandy ground, uh, sulfur would be an issue. and uh, some of our hill ground and other places there may be a, a zinc issue. Do you normally recommend uh, fall soil sampling or would you rather wait until the spring? I don't have a great preference but uh, I think the important thing is to be consistent. I like to uh, compare it to the uh, toilet bowl and the reservoir after you uh, remove all your crop there's a time period where the soil kind of re-equilibrates and so you, sometimes you get higher soil testing numbers in the spring than the fall, but uh, producers who are in it for the long haul, they should sample about the same time every two or three years whenever they sample. That way they can have a better idea what the trends are. What about the efficiency of applications in the fall as opposed to in the spring? Uh, the things to consider there are the soil texture where we have uh, heavier textured soils. Uh, a producer could put on anhydrous ammonia. I wouldn't have any kind of UAN liquid uh, materials or urea dry materials. We only recommend anhydrous ammonia because it's going in the ground. It's in the ammonia form. It needs to be done when the soil temperatures are low. And uh, on coarse textured soils, we don't recommend full application. For phosphorus and potassium, if they're on ground that's not highly erodible, uh, they could do some spreading as, and certainly lime could be applied in the fall. Is there still a, a concern about leaching if there's a lot of water in that profile yet? What we're concerned about on the leaching is what happens after the nitrogen is put on. Uh, if we have a warm period and the ammonia turns to nitrate, then either when it's waterlogged or when water moves through it, uh, there would be leaching. So from a, a an agronomy point of view, the basic underlying principle is to put the N on closest to when the crop needs it. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to more information and recommendations about soil sampling. And now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast during this past week. The real significant weather maker was with the system that moved through in the early part of the week. And really, the panhandle was a big beneficiary of moisture. Most locations were within the uh, third of an inch to two thirds of an inch range. And we did have some reports of snowfall. And then, of course, we had a little system move through during the middle of the week that dropped just a small pocket of shower activity in portions of east central and southeast Nebraska. Most totals were under two tenths of an inch. And now we have an impending Arctic air mass ready to move down the pipe and bring us some well below normal temperatures for next week and probably most locations in the state that have not seen snow are going to see at least a few snowflakes coming out of the air. So let's take a look at the upper air model and see how this will progress. Right now you can see that we have a northwest flow with an upper trough over the Great Lakes. This is actually an extension of an upper air uh, low that is sitting over the Hudson Bay region that is extending to back toward the west and is going to pivot energy around and drive a cold front through our region as we go into the early part of the next week. So as you get through this week and enjoy the weather, this is probably the last shot of real nice weather you're going to see for at least a week to 10 days. 
So we'll be looking at fair skies today, and as we get to tomorrow, you'll start to see some of this energy starting to move toward the southeast, but we are still going to stay warm, well above normal temperatures. We may even see some 70-degree weather in the extreme southwest corner of the state. And as we get into Monday, all of a sudden you see this rapid progression of the system coming southward. Actually, it'll start entering the state during uh, the midnight to early morning hours across northern Nebraska, and we could start to see temperatures fall throughout the day across the northern part of the state, starting out as rain and mixing with a little bit of light snow. Keep an eye on the forecast because right now there is a lot of discrepancy in regards to the amount of precipitation. Generally a tenth to a quarter of an inch is expected with this system. If it comes through a little bit slower, we could see some moderate snow accumulation across the streams of northern Nebraska. But as it moves southward, it's going to weaken and we're only expecting sprinkles to light flurry activity here in the southern part of the state. Much colder temperatures and as we get into Tuesday, very cold temperatures as most of the energy rains to the east of us, but the cold air comes down the pipe. We'll be looking at highs that will be consistently in the upper 20s to the mid 30 degree range statewide. Warmest temperature will be in the southwest. We get another reinforcing shot of cold air on Wednesday, so we'll see, start to see some flurry activity taking place, particularly across the panhandle. Um, again, temperatures are going to be consistently in that upper 20s to low 30 degree range. And as we get into Thursday, we start to see some relaxation, but another least of energy comes through. It might chop off a few flurry activity uh, over the northern part of the state that might hold into the day on Friday. But yet, we're starting to see the ridge building back in, so warmer air is in store. It's just going to be a very cold week. So, if we look at the temperature forecast, you'll notice that consistently going downhill, the majority of the precipitation will fall on Monday. We looked at the 8 to 14 day forecast. We'll see that cold air starting to slide toward the east, warmer air coming in, and in terms of precipitation, nothing to speak of. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found individually on the Market Journal website. They include information on corn and soybean markets, GMO labeling initiatives, expanding the cow herd, and fall soil sampling. As always, you can keep track of Market Journal during the week by following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Next week, Elaine Cub will analyze corn and soybean markets after the November crop report. Tina Barrett will explain the importance of determining costs of production on your operation, and Tom Hunt will talk about neonicotinoid seed treatments in your soybeans. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.